Emergency forces in the UK and around the world need to plan for CBRN incidents, where CBRN is an abbreviation for chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear. We will consider the latter two, radiological and nuclear incidents. Radiological hazards are those that arise from radioactive materials, i.e. materials containing unstable isotopes of elements which decay to a more stable isotope by emitting radiation, typically in the form of particles such as alpha or beta particles or neutrons, or by emitting energy in the form of gamma rays. It is often the case that decay given particle radiation is also accompanied by gamma radiation. For most radiologically hazardous materials, the effects scale linearly with the amount, so that if one material has twice the amount of radiologically active material as another, it will also be twice as radioactive. This is not the case for all radiologically hazardous materials, however. A subset can exhibit the behaviour that the radiation increases rapidly as more material is concentrated at a location. As radiation equates to a release of energy, this behaviour means that as material is concentrated, more energy is released over shorter timescales until, in the limit, a point can be reached where an explosion occurs. This refers to the N, or nuclear hazard. To obtain these behaviour characteristics, nuclear hazardous materials are those in which a nuclear chain reaction can occur, of which there are two main types, fusion and fission. A third class of materials, based on certain semi-stable states of atoms such as hafnium-178 meta, which can be caused to spontaneously decay via an external stimulus, is also possible, but is not described here. To understand fission and fusion, we need to consider how the nucleus of an atom is structured. A simple model is a collection of protons and neutrons in a roughly spherical shape. As the protons are all positively charged, their mutual repulsion would resist this, and the configuration would not normally be considered as a stable one. However, another force, called the strong nuclear force, is more powerful than this repulsion on the distant scales of a nucleus, and this binds the nucleus together. For light nuclei, this bound state is more stable than an unbound state. This means that if two light nuclei can overcome their long-range electrostatic repulsion enough that the short-range strong nuclear force can come into play, then they can bind together into a more stable form, releasing energy. This is called nuclear fusion, and it occurs in stars, where light elements, such as hydrogen, are fused to form heavier elements, such as helium. This process can occur for all nuclides up to iron. After iron, the nucleus starts getting too large for the strong nuclear force to be effective, and these heavier nuclides are less stable in a bound state. For most heavy nuclides, however, a decay to lighter ones cannot occur as an energy barrier exists which prevents it. For very heavy nuclides, such as those of uranium and plutonium, however, this energy barrier can be crossed, and the nucleus undergoes spontaneous fission, in which it splits into two roughly equal-sized daughters and ejects two or three neutrons. It is the ejection of neutrons that gives these materials their nuclear hazard potential. The neutrons can collide with other heavy element nuclides causing an induced fission. These newly fissioned nuclei give rise to further neutrons that can propagate the process, leading to a so-called chain reaction. As each fission releases energy, the number of fission events per second gives the energy release per second, or the power. There are three configurations of material with fissile properties. In the first, the material is dispersed, so that the probability of the liberated neutrons from a spontaneous fission inducing a further fission is quite small, as the neutrons will simply miss them. This is the so-called subcritical configuration. As the concentration of material increases, so does the chance of induced fission, so that the rate of energy release and neutron production increases. Eventually, a configuration is reached where out of the two or three neutrons released by a fission, one goes on to induce a further fission and the remainder are either lost from the material or absorbed in a manner that does not lead to fission. This is the so-called critical configuration and it is the state inside commercial nuclear reactors. As a byproduct of the absorption of neutrons in core materials, reactors can be used to produce radioisotopes. Examples might be the production of radioactive samarium-153 from stable samarium-152 and polonium-210 from bismuth-209. The state of criticality is maintained in a power reactor using active and passive design features to ensure that each fission leads only to one further fission and no more. If each fission did produce more than one further fission, then, unless inhibited, the rate of fission would increase exponentially 
and an explosion would occur. While this is avoided by designing a power reactor, it is incorporated by designing a nuclear weapon, a device which is deliberately put into a so-called supercritical configuration. The supercritical configuration does not necessarily lead to an explosion. There are two reasons for this. The first is the nature of the neutron release. The majority of neutrons released by fission are so-called prompt neutrons, that is, they are produced during the fission event. A small fraction are, however, called delayed neutrons, and they are released after a short delay. A supercritical assembly may be produced, but if the number of prompt neutrons is below a critical value, called a prompt critical value, then the rate of growth of energy output will be too small to cause an explosion. If the configuration is such that a prompt criticality can occur, then an explosion is still not guaranteed. The reason for this is as the criticality is approached and exceeded, the power produced increases, which increases the temperature of the system. This reduces the ability of the neutrons to induce further fission and also leads to thermal expansion of the system, which reduces the criticality of the system and stabilizes the energy output. A typical power response to assembling a critical configuration shows a sharp pulse of power followed by a much lower sustained output. Such a curve was used to investigate the effects of a criticality accident caused by Louis Lotin at Los Alamos on the 21st of May 1946. In this accident, Slotin was demonstrating the technique of critical assembly using a subcritical sphere of plutonium and two beryllium neutron reflectors, the upper of which was movable so it could be lowered into place to achieve a criticality. In the demonstration, Slotin kept the upper reflector away from the source using a screwdriver blade which inadvertently slipped and resulted in a prompt criticality. The observers saw a blue glow of ionized air and felt a heat wave as energy was released. Although this accident assembled a prompt critical configuration for a fraction of a second, it did not lead to an explosion as the heat produced controlled the reactions. Slotin received a dose of 21 sieverts in this accident and died nine days later. As the supercriticality of the assembled material increases, so does the height of the power pulse. If enough material is assembled, the power pulse becomes high enough to cause an explosion, which destroys the assembly and prevents further fissions from occurring. The amount of supercriticality increases as two subcritical pieces approach each other. If this is slow compared with the fission initiation and growth time, then the device will destroy itself prematurely and produce a very low yield, known as a fizzle. To achieve high detonation yields, the assembly must be rapid. The little boy nuclear weapon dropped on Hiroshima at the end of World War II used a modified gun to assemble two subcritical uranium assemblies in about half a millisecond. To achieve assembly detonation with plutonium is more difficult than this, the assembly would have to take place about three times quicker. Because of this, Plutonium devices are initiated by explosive compression, rather than rapid assembly. Such a technology requires relatively sophisticated materials and electronics. Once detonated, the fission rate increases exponentially, so that the explosion takes place over about 30 generations, and 86% of the energy is released in the last generation. The time between generations is determined by how long it takes a neutron to travel from production during fission to inducing a further fission. This is about 10 billionths of a second, a time interval known as a shake.